and welcome to Primetime Watchmaking in the News, where we talk about business and of course a lot of watches. So last month was full of surprises and with watches and wonders and the big Geneva week ahead of us, well April won't be short of such either. And since our previous edition, so we have been quite busy with the Horopedia project, which I presented to you a little while ago. So if you're interested in uh, what's happening there, well, please uh, visit the website horopedia.org for more information as we updated it with uh, some fresh uh, walkthrough videos on watchmaking museums from Switzerland and France, as well as some, uh, some uh, visual definition of some watchmaking tools. So we also launched our Watch Waking podcast, where we discuss the latest trends trends, news and tendencies of the industry with watchmakers and experts. It's kind of an audio extension of Primetime and it will give you a, a 360 degree view of the entire horological ecosystem. And now onto the business news and market developments. So on March the 10th, Switzerland along with Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein signed a free trade pact with India which will receive 100 billion US dollars in investments over the next 15 years in exchange of a significant reduction of import taxes for a list of goods, including, of course, watches. So for the EFTA countries, this means a 15-year almost unlimited access to the Indian fast-growing market in pharmaceutical, new technologies, and luxury. And the Swiss watch brands will benefit from up to 1.4 billion customers who will be likely to spend their money at home as the extremely high tariffs were the last bastion preventing the Swiss watchmakers from offering competitive prices on their products. Nonetheless, a lot needs to be done in terms of distribution and retail solutions, but since all five signatories must first ratify the agreement between EFTA countries and India before it can come into effect, probably not before 2025, well, this gives a little bit of time for brands to think about their expansion on this uh, strategic growth territory. Okay, let's continue. And uh, speaking of brands, Morgan Stanley and Le Lux Consult released their yearly report rating the top performing names in the horological universe and obviously revealing some, un uh, well, some interesting trends. So unsurprisingly, Rolex dominated the Swiss watch market last year, achieving an astronomical turnover of 10 billion Swiss uh, francs above uh, one, uh, 11 billion US dollars. So despite some of its models slightly dropping in prices on the secondary market in the last two years. Among some other significant uh, highlights uh, is the comeback of Swatch uh, to the list of the tw uh, top 20 companies, a list still led by the usual suspects besides uh, Rolex, of course, meaning Cartier, Omega, AP, Patek and Richard Mille. And interestingly enough, Swatch, absent from the ranking since 2018, has pushed out Blancpain from the listing. And that's quite a funny paradox considering last year's launch of uh, the collaboration between Swatch and Blancpain. But despite this, the Swatch group experienced a notable decline in overall points. But we have a new member in the Billionaires Club as Vacheron Constantin has surpassed the psychological level of 1 billion US dollar in turnover. What's more exciting to see was the number of independents emerging in the report. 15 out of 50 top companies ranking for 2023 are indie brands. And here are some of my observations. Well, first, the gap between affordable and pure luxury is getting wider, which at some point may lead to considerable uh, changes in the market. So despite the fact that the mid-range sector remains the most desired one, last year's customers apparently voted for more affordable options provided by Swatch, for instance. So we can love it or hate it, but money doesn't lie. Second is the increasing premiumization and the rise in hyper luxury brands. So if you check the list, Richard Mille being on the fifth place in turnovers sold only 5,600 uh, timepieces, well, it's already quite a lot, which means that the average price per piece was over 312 thousand US dollars. I mean, that's quite impressive. Some brands from the list uh, have also picked the uh, tactics of raising the prices while limiting the production or discontinuing some of the models which instantly created a hype around them. And the third observation is that there's an ever-growing passion for sports and remastered vintage model, which means that we will see more of such in the near future, something naturally already witnessed over the last few years. Returning to Swatch and its marketing triumphs, the 11 Moon Swatch suitcases mentioned in the last prime time were auctioned at Sotheby's for 600,000 US dollars, and all proceeds will benefit the Orbis Foundation, with whom Swatch has collaborated since 2011. 
So one might consider this as a significant sum for a collection of timepieces with a slightly similar appearance, but there was a noble cause behind the purchase. So additionally, uh, collectors understand the alluring of acquiring something rare, desirable and potentially unique. And now we, have, uh, we are having another hype with a special Snoopy edition of the Moon Swatch to celebrate the second anniversary of the collaboration between Swatch and Omega. So the new model has a moon phase, which is something truly innovative for these watches, and a luminous dials. With this release, I wouldn't be a surprise to see Swatch climbing several positions in the next Morgan Stanley rankings in 2025. Actually, in 2024, because we're still in 2024. And this might be an interesting development for the Swatch group, which seems to be uh, targeted towards delisting from the stock market, something that's been, already been discussed for quite a while. And some experts consider Nick Hayek that, he, that he's like intentionally downgrading the prices of the group's share to get a better price for himself and make it 100% family business. But there's definitely something cooking in this group, of, uh, in this uh, house of cards of watchmaking as the Swatch Group plans to convene its next ordinary general meeting of shareholders on the 8th of May 2024 with one of the goals to elect Nick Hayek's nephew, Mark Hayek, as a new member of the board of directors. So Mark Hayek has served as a member of the management board since 2005 and currently holds the position of CEO at Blancpain. And well, what a surprise. I mean, the current uh, board of uh, director of Swatch Group already unanimously supported this nomination. Okay, another interesting rumor has emerged from the Val de Travers as the Sando family, renowned for its uh, pharmaceutical business under the Novartis brand, uh, well, is reportedly preparing to sell two of its uh, watch assets, the Parmig uh, Parmigiani Florier brand, but also the Parmigiani group, which regroups different manufacturing entities. So according to Ms. Tweed, who first broke the news, both will soon be on the market, and last year Parmigiani, the brand, saw a remarkable 50% increase in sales, reaching 75 uh, million uh, US dollars, as reported by the Morgan Stanley report. So although the Sando Fam uh, Foundation has declined to comment on this scoop, and the news is yet to be officially confirmed, however, it uh, sparked widespread speculation on who might be the potential owner of the package deal. So the Sando Family Foundation initiated the development of the Parmigiani Fleury Group in 1996, and today it comprises five artisanal companies primarily focused on the brand Parmigiani Fleury, but also serving other high-end watchmakers. Cadrance and Habillage produces dials, Les Artisans Boitier uh, manufacture cases, Vaucher manufacturer specializes in movement, while Atocalpo and uh, Elwind are responsible for various watch components, mainly movement parts, including regulating organs. So yes, quite a powerful mix of competencies there, and acquiring all these companies all together seems the most logical step with LVMH emerging as a potential suitor. But one must remember that Hermès is already a minority shareholder of Vaucher, and uh, I might have, it might have some kind of first right of refusal. I don't know about that, but who knows? Okay, so however, I mean, it's better to wait for an official announcement or statement from the Sando family before speculating any further. Okay, next topic, and while we often uh, cover uh, watch sales from the largest auction houses, an upcoming uh, event promises to be truly exceptional, as on April the 11th, amidst uh, watches and wonder, Sotheby's will host a groundbreaking auction titled Rough Diamonds. Set in an underground wine cellar here in Geneva, this online auction features treasures dating from the 70s uh, through to the 90s. Uh, such an unconventional event is a result of the collaboration between Sotheby's and Heist Out, a self-proclaimed outcast watch magazine launched a year ago. One-of-a-kind underground watch auction offers uh, 24 exceptional vintage models from AP, Patek, Vacheron, Gégère, and Piaget, among others, and each timepiece offers a blend of unique design, rare technical innovation, notable uh, provenance, or historical significance. So the preview will be held at La Cornavin, a wine bar in Geneva, from April uh, the 8th to the 10th, uh, in the evenings only. So you can find the details below if you want to attend, if you are in Geneva at that period. Another big auction house is changing its location this spring, bringing an end to uh, the era of fierce bidding inside the tent of La Reserve in Geneva. So from May onwards, Philips, in association with Bax and Russo, is moving from one luxury place to another and will be holding its auctions at the President Wilson Hotel. So facing the Geneva Lake, this five-star hotel is well known in Geneva as a place for different international negotiations and flamboyant evening events, and the access to the venue will be in some way easier for the participants, however, it might lack a bit of privacy. So this landmark move is related to the house's 10th anniversary and signifies a moment of growth and evolution for Philips 
Philips. Uh, since its uh, inaugural auction in May 2015, Philips Watches has garnered an unparalleled market leading total of 1.3 billion US dollars in global watch auctions, underscoring its enduring impact on the industry. So we're looking forward to checking out the new exhibition space on the pool of the terrace of the President Wilson, as well as the new timepieces prepared for the watch auction number 19 taking place on the 11th and 12th of May, followed by the Geneva Jewel auction number 2 on the 13th. And let's not forget Christie's and their sales coming in May. This time the auction house has the privilege of presenting several timepieces from the private collection of none other than Michael Schumacher, celebrating the 30th anniversary of his first Formula One Drivers' Championship win in 1994. So the Rare Watches auction is set uh, for May the 13th at the Four Seasons Hotel uh, here in Geneva and will include a section uh, dedicated to this group of watches highlighting key moments in Schumacher, Schumacher's uh, career. Among the lots will be the Royal Oak chronograph uh, featuring Ferrari's famous uh, prancing horse emblem on the dial at 6 o'clock. The numeral 1 in the 30-minute uh, register dial at 3 o'clock is surrounded by six stars representing Michael Schumacher's six uh, world uh, championship victories between 1994 and 2003, uh, while in the 12-hour register at 9 o'clock has a picture of Schumacher's red racing helmet and can be considered as a unique timepiece. Another watch from the collection is a unique FP Jaune Vagabondage 1 model featuring a red dial and an engraved uh, personal gift dedication on the 18th uh, carat gold movement. The red Ferrari dial bears symbols representing Michael Schumacher's seven Formula One World Championship uh, victories achieved by 2004 and includes Schumacher's uh, racing helmet together with the emblem of the Scuderia. Well, both uh, timepieces are exceptional not only for their feature, but of course for the provenance and are highly recommended to check in person in May in Geneva if you're here again. And to close uh, the auction section of this prime time, just wanted to add that Only Watch is trying to make a comeback also for the May auction, but nothing yet confirmed. It will most certainly not be the same as uh, what was perhaps initially planned. And it seems some brands have sold their timepieces in the meantime, some not really willing to be associated with the event either. Well, quite a few question marks, uh, and as we already discussed, once the trust element is gone, I mean, it's quite difficult to repatch things together. We'll see. But despite this, we have another nice little story coming from Bulgari and its partnership with the Luxury Tribune newspaper and the Swiss Center for Luxury Research. In February 2022, the Italian brand launched Swiss Genius, a student prize designed to reward technological innovation in corporate social responsibility. This year marks its uh, third edition, and the theme of the contest is defined as Swissness. So according to Antoine Pain, Bulgari Watch Division Director, the term uh, represents a state of mind of, co of consensus, shared value, and a common vision that prevails here in Switzerland. So the prize is open to, uh, to students from various Swiss uh, universities and higher education institutions. And the year-long selection process began in March, comprising uh, two selection rounds. And the award ceremony is scheduled for the 3rd of July 2025. I think this is quite a clever idea to integrate young people into real life problems and invite them to propose their effective solution to the sustainability challenges that the new generation uh, brands are facing. And to almost finish the business part, well, here's a short story from Japan where at least 900 luxury watches have disappeared almost in the blink of an eye. So the simple uh, scheme uh, worth more than 12.5 million US dollars was developed and then implemented by the 42-year-old genius Takazumi Fukuhara and his company Neo Reverso. So he created a platform for renting luxury timepieces called Toke Match. And the idea was to let watch owners rent their exquisite timepieces to those who can't afford or do not want to buy an expensive uh, watch. So the owner then benefited from a monthly rental fee and however the temptation was there and the owner of Neo Reverso failed to resist it. So according to the Japanese uh, media, instead of renting the watches, Mr. Fukuhara was putting them on sale at different auctions and second-hand stores massing in total this $12 million. So uh, late last year, Neo Reverso also had also advertised for luxury watches for the service but was apparently having uh, watches appraised for resale purposes at the same time. 
So sharing economy scam was unveiled in February, right after Tokyo Match announced its termination. So the Tokyo police have obtained an arrest warrant for Mr. Fukuhara, who allegedly fled the country while at least 109, 190 watch owners are still waiting for their timepieces to be returned. And this story once more raises the issue of uh, trust between uh, watch owners and uh, third parties, as well as the question of proper insurance for your watch. So let us know uh, in your comments what you think of this situation and how uh, to avoid it in the future. And as a transition between business news and new watches, I will now talk about Audemars Piguet, as I was very kindly invited by the brand to attend what they call their yearly AP Social Club, which this year took place in Milan. So one might think the choice of the Italian city was a way to mark the Italian origin of the brand's new CEO, Mrs. Uh, Ilaria Resta, but actually it had more to do uh, with the presentation of their new AP house, which took three years in the making, and I must say it is super spectacular. It's their biggest AP house ever, more than 1,600 square meters, divided into multiple floors with some beautiful terraces, offering really nice views of the city and located right in the middle of Milan's fancy district. It is housed in an old garage and funnily enough it dominates the Louis Vuitton store, though one could legitimately think that LVMH could have some kind of an appetite for the brand of Le Bressu. Well, I must say this amused me a bit, but we were mainly there to see some of the new pieces AP will launch this year, and there were some really sexy ones. First of all, I have to admit that the code 1159 is evolving quite nicely and we got to see models with some really pretty colored guilloche dials either as a simple three-handers or chronograph version. And I also got to see a new shade of gold, which uh, the brand called Sand Gold. And it was the first applied to a piece initially released in 2022 for the Royal Rogue's uh, 50th anniversary with the caliber 2972, combining a self-winding mechanism with a flying tourbillon. In the presented uh, model, the movement is open work, which adds a feeling of lightness to the 41 mm size timepiece. And the new galvanic champagne color, however, is really interesting. It is a special 18 karat gold, alloy of solid gold, copper and palladium and it's really when you put it uh, next to regular white gold or steel gold royal oak that this new hue comes to life. There's something really quite warm about it. So still concerning immaterial, AP presented new ways of combining ceramics which allows for instance to come up with camo uh, patterns and though no watch were, were presented I'm pretty sure we will see this in the near future. I also got to see in real the Royal Low Concept Flying Tourbillon Tamara Ralph limited edition piece and I know we already talked about it in a previous edition of Primetime but yep, in real this piece is quite something, I mean really spectacular, I love the optical effect of these concentric circles right down to the tourbillon itself, sweet. And then plenty of other sweet Royal Oak pieces, including my favorite of the show with the skeleton white gold version, a cool green dial one, and a very nice perpetual calendar done in collaboration with musician and serious watch aficionado, John Mayer. So let's now continue with other watches, and in only a few weeks we will be fully submerged under the tsunami of watch novelties presented here in Geneva uh, in the different uh, watch shows, but I would like to present you several timepieces that are worth checking before the horological hiatus begins. So first, the new collaboration between Frédéric Constant and Romaric André, the slimline mood phase date manufacturer. And the artist known better under the name Seconde Seconde has a number of projects with different watch brands ranging from H. Moser to Full and Mari. And the new timepiece looks very classy, but it's classy with a little twist thanks to Seconde Seconde. So powered by the automatic in-house Caliber FC705, the new watch has a polished three-part 42mm stainless steel case with a matte silver dial featuring moon phase and date display. The only thing that is not conventional with this model is the indication of time. As the artist explains, I mean, watch lovers are in constant search for perfection, but when it comes to perfect, then starts to regret the lack of soul and connection with the artisanal roots of watchmaking. And this is why the applied hour indexes on, on the dial are unevenly placed and inclined to different directions, showcasing the beauty of a little chaos. Quite a funky approach to a dress watch. Okay, and next watch, and a truly brilliant way of being unconventional in the world of strict forms and classic dials of uh, dress watches, was presented by Bulgar with a new Octofinissimo Automatic to celebrate the 140th anniversary of the Italian brand. 
So Fabrizio Buenomassa managed to exceed the, uh, the excellence of his previous model with the sketch dial and delivered a rather funky take on the octo finissimo. So the dial of the new timepiece depicts the mechanism inside, but not in a boring way. Something similar was done by H. Moser uh, a little while ago in a concept, uh, in a concept watch, uh, the Endeavor Perpetual Calendar tutorial. And I like the fact that Bulgari decided not to collaborate with a fancy artist, but rather use the exceptional designing skills of their most praised experts. So the sketch pattern is hand-drawn by Buenamassa himself and applied directly onto the titanium surface. And each of the 70 anniversary model is signed on the back case, making it a unique piece of art. And talking about indexes, well, these were completely absent from H. Moser and Company's new timepiece, as on February the 21st, the brand released yet another model for 2024, the Streamliner Perpetual Calendar Concept Smoked Salmon, a new and minimalist variation of the 42.3 mm steel Streamliner Perpetual Calendar, previously introduced in August 2021. So the only elements you will find on the signature fumé dial referred to as smoked salmon are four central uh, uh, hands for hours, minutes, seconds and months, and a power reserve indicator at 10 o'clock and an aperture at 4 o'clock showcasing the date. With this new release, H. Moser once again performs a true simplification exercise, erasing the indexes and the logo previously uh, discreetly engraved in the, the sapphire glass. So your eyes simply enjoy the luminous and ever-changing smoked colors of the dial with the date aperture. Simplicity at its best, it is also reflected in the time and date setting using a double pool crown found at 4 o'clock. And the watch has 168 hours of power reserve, is water resistant to 120 meters, and has this flash calendar feature making for a very smooth and precise date change. And uh, the hand wound movement HMC 8102, uh, allowing for a date setting forward, backward at any time. In a nutshell, this new Streamliner Perpetual Calendar embodies a combination of both pure elegance and complication at the same time. Now, on a more practical note, as with the brand's uh, previous model, Streamliner Center Second Smoked Salmon released in 2023, well, this new edition will only be produced for one year. So if a new Perpetual Calendar was on your radar to add to your collection, this watch just under 57 thousand uh, US dollar just might be your chance. The next timepiece is an impeccable balance of technical innovation and finishing which uh, represents the essence of Swiss high quality watchmaking and I'm delighted to present to you not only the new watch but a new brand created by two of uh, my dear friends who I had the pleasure to interview several times and the new constellation was born from the collaboration of two watchmaking stars Dominique Renault and Julien Tixier. So the first watch presented by Renault Tixier brand is uh, called Monday and it showcases their first innovation, a kinetic engine micro rotor. The idea that pushes the boundaries of micromechanics came from a thorough research made by Dominique Renault in the area of energy to enhance winding efficiency of a watch. He managed to improve the micro rotor by installing its center, in its center, the auxiliary mechanism. So the latter optimizes the use of energy released by the rotor and harnesses even the slightest joule to power the watch. This central engine of the micro rotor is visible through the aperture at 9 o'clock and on the back the view is just sublime. The watch measures a full 40.8 mm and thanks to the Dancer micro rotor has 40, uh, 60 hours of uh, power reserve. Energy is the first out of seven uh, fundamental watchmaking principles Renault Tixier, Renault Tixier aims to revisit and I would love to see the rest of the days of this week of innovation and I know we will. Okay, next topic and it will be a little bit of an exaggeration but one must admit that La Fabrique du Temps of Louis Vuitton might have stolen the show from Watches and Wonder already. I mean, just weeks before the, the, the biggest horological festival of the world, the uh, watchmaking uh, magicians from this manufacturer have made several fantastic releases, not only in their aesthetic features, but in technology used. So the Louis Vuitton Voyager Flying Tourbillon Poinçon de Genève Plique à Jour has an outstanding design with a marvel as a movement. The dial of the watch looks uh, like a vitrail or a stained glass, However, it's a meticulous blue plique à jour enamel. So the skeletonized uh, case uh, displays a V tourbillon cage at 6 o'clock, fully rotating in one minute, adding to the precision of the uh, in-house LV104 caliber. The dial at 12 o'clock is also made in plique à jour technique, retaining the center that holds the hands to indicate hours and minutes. 
The watch is 41 mm in diameter, 11.68 thickness, with 80 hours of power reserve and anti-reflection sapphire dial. Another timepiece uh, from the Poisson de Genève series is uh, the Tambour Moon Flying Tourbillon uh, Poisson de Genève Saphir, created in collaboration with the world-renowned architect Frank Gehry. So the case, the lugs and the crown are made from sapphire and designed by Gehry, who also happens uh, to be the architect, uh, architect of the Louis Vuitton Foundation building in Paris. Beautiful building. With over 250 hours of work, uh, this one-of-a-kind timepiece boasts one of the most technically complex dial designs La Fabrique du Temps, uh, Louis Vuitton, has ever created. The smooth lines are carved directly in the sapphire glass, and rumor has it that several of these were broken before the final intricate design uh, was achieved. So hidden behind the glass is the flying tourbillon caliber stamp with the Poisson de Genève seal. And to give you some uh, more detail, the watch is 43.8 mm in diameter, 11.27 in thickness, water resistant to 30 meter, and has Frank Gehry's signature engraved on the case back. Okay, let's now talk about the Montgolfier, and it is a collaboration with Lippe 1839, the famous creators of uh, time-telling objects. And throughout the rich history of the brand, Lepe 1839 has developed an exceptional table clock collection, which we covered uh, previously in our videos. So this uh, Montgolfier Aereo is one of a one-of-a-kind horological object which combines the high watchmaking, high jewelry, and trunk-making savoir-faire. So it's a whimsical uh, reinterpretation of uh, Louis Vuitton's iconic heritage and consists of 207 uh, components and has a Lepe 1855LR mechanical caliber with 8 days of power reserve. The balloon is made from the, a copper beryllium alloy and Makassar wood, which is rather difficult to work with due to its high density. For its decoration, LV used 1,420 round diamonds for uh, roughly 55.8 uh, uh, carats, one briolet cut citrine for 9 carats, and one square cut citrine. I mean, all packed in the signature LV case that the brand normally uses transfer, to transfer World Cups and other exceptional prizes. And the coolest thing is that it can be suspended in the air and hang from the ceiling, transforming into some kind of real flying object. So now it's kind of time to say goodbye and thanks a lot for watching and download, downloading our podcast and see you real soon with some new watchmaking adventures, watches of course and interviews. So the very best to all, see you soon and viva watchmaking!